So I want to talk about what damages the gut, uh, share some literature that I think supports my concerns for that, and then talk about certain conditions. And then I will talk about how I think we reverse that and how we can heal our guts and then give ourselves the foundation to become freaking awesome radical humans. There are many things that damage the gut. I think that plant foods, predominantly vegetables, can contain many defense chemicals like lectins, carbohydrate binding proteins, which can be very damaging to the gut. One of the canonical lectins is gluten, which I'll talk about in a moment. I think this is problematic for both celiacs and non-celiacs. Though I've been criticized online for showing papers which show inflammation in the guts of celiac disease patients when they are exposed to lectins, uh, in a moment I will share papers that suggest there are inflammatory issues for those with non-celiac gluten sensitivity when exposed to gluten as well. Um, and I think it's important to understand that gluten is just one lectin uh, of a family of lectins that is quite broad. Lectins are predominantly found in seeds, seeds being seeds, nuts, grains, and beans. And these lectins appear to damage the gut, something that has not been talked about a whole lot, but I think is often overlooked in terms of uh, things that could be potentially harming our guts. I also think that other plant compounds, as I hinted at earlier, capsicum spices, even sweet bell peppers, hot peppers can damage the gut. They can open tight junctions formed by occludin and clodin proteins and release zonulin. I will actually show a paper with regard to that in a moment into, uh, and cause leaky gut, which is the colloquial term for a damaged open epithelium, a fenestrated gastrointestinal epithelium, if you uh, will. I think that toxins in the environment can probably damage the gut. Things like glyphosate and pesticides, which appear to be in nearly goddamn everything these days. Um, I think that lack of sunlight, lack of nutrients can damage the gut. There's good evidence that zinc is essential for proper gut permeability, or I should say gut integrity. And where do we got find zinc that is bioavailable? We find it from animal foods. Good luck getting your zinc from plant foods. Uh, vegans would try to eat a ton of pumpkin seeds, but most of that zinc is going to be bound by phytates, uh, by oxalates. And as I've shown in the past, it is very, very poorly bioavailable. Antibiotics can damage the gut, leading to dysbiosis. We know that different types of bacteria can also signal to the gut to open gap junctions and cause leaky gut, fenestrated gut epithelium. I have concerns that artificial sweeteners, including stevia and stevia derivatives can damage the gut. And it's clear that things like seed oils, and processed sugars can also damage the gut. So uh, the cards are stacked against us, my friends. Let's start with this paper, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Triggers gut dysbiosis, neuroinflammation, gut brain axis dysfunction, and vulnerability for dementia. That's a bad, uh, that's a bad crew. That is a motley crew. Um, I do not think humans should mess with gluten, even if you are not formally celiac. Um, they go on to say in the abstract, dysbiosis and non-celiac gluten sensitivity causes gut inflammation, diarrhea, constipation, visceral hypersensitivity. That's hypersensitivity in the viscera, the gut region, abdominal pain, a dysfunctional metabolic state. We've heard about that a lot. And peripheral immune and neuroimmune communication. Not good. You don't want your peripheral immune system communicating with your neuroimmune system because that leads to neuroinflammation. Thus, immune-mediated gut and extra gut dysfunction due to gluten sensitivity with comorbid diarrhea may last for decades. A significant proportion of non-celiac gluten sensitivity patients may chronically consume alcohol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and a fatty diet, I would say a seed oil or a processed sugar diet, as well as suffer from various comorbid disorders. They go on to say, therapeutic measures include probiotics, vagus nerve, blah, 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 blah. Why not just get rid of the goddamn gluten? <laughs> So I'm not a fan of gluten for anyone. That is such an important point that I will repeat it. I am not a fan of gluten for any human. I believe there's a good amount of evidence that gluten, the lectin, and one of its components, gliadin, do induce the release of zonulin in intestinal epithelial cells in vitro and in vivo, Activation of the zonulin pathway by protein kinase C, mediated cytoskeleton reorganization and tight junction opening, aka leaky gut, leads to a rapid increase in intestinal permeability. 
That's a bad thing, guys. And I think that there is enough evidence to suggest that this happens in everyone by having gluten and its fragments gliadin mimic pathogen-associated and damage-associated molecular patterns, PAMPs and DAMPs uh, of bacteria, that it leads to a danger signal in the gut and your gap junctions open, along with other lectins. But predominantly gluten is what I'm talking about right now. Consider this paper as well, regulation of tight junction permeability by intestinal bacteria and dietary components. Intestinal bacteria can open tight junctions when they become dysbiotic or overgrown. What causes dysbiosis? Lectins do. I'll show you papers with that in a moment. But various dietary components are also known to regulate epithelial permeability when modifying expression and localization of tight junction proteins. This is an interesting graphic for those who are watching. Of a tight junction, there is a uh, and, uh, a blown up picture of these epithelial tight junctions from the gut with the occluded and the clodin protein, the jam family of proteins, a paracellular space, zonulin being there intracellularly. And if you go on in this paper, in celiac disease, pathogenesis is induced by gliadin, a glycoprotein present in wheat. Ex vivo human intestinal samples from celiac patients in remission also showed zonulin release when exposed to gliadin, meaning that if you have celiac disease, even if you're in remission, you're going to get uh, zonulin release when you're exposed to gliadin. I believe there's also good evidence that many humans will release zonulin, if not all humans, when they're exposed to gluten, even if they are not celiac. This is the non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Most food components have not been studied. However, in screening of vegetable extract, an extract of sweet pepper that is probably red and green bell peppers increased uh, was found to increase intestinal permeability, which the authors describe as a decrease in TEER, that is trans epithelial resistance, electrical resistance. This is in cell culture specifically. In another study, Solanaceae spices, I've talked about these in the past. These are nightshades, such as cayenne paper, cayenne pepper, paprika, were found to cause an immediate decrease in the trans epithelial electrical resistance in vitro in the, elect in the ileocecal adenocarcinoma cell line. In the case of paprika, this was accompanied by an increase in small molecule permeability and aberrant staining of zonulin 1, paprika causing leaky gut in cell culture models. That's not a good thing, guys. This is why I'm not a fan of solanaceae, why I'm not a fan of nightshade spices, nightshade foods. In a more recent screening of over 300 food extracts, things that a lot of humans don't eat, uh, galangal, marigold, hops, also decreased trans epithelial electrical gradient, but not many foods have been studied in this way, but foods do this in the human gut, and that is a problem. Here they note trace elements such as zinc may also assist with the maintenance of intestinal barrier integrity. I mentioned that earlier. Where do you get your zinc from? You probably get it from animal foods. That's where you should be getting it from. Let's go a little deeper into the lectin rabbit hole. It's an interesting paper from 1988. Bacteria lectin interactions in the phytohemagglutinin induced bacterial overgrowth, uh, small intestinal model. So PHA is the lectin found in red kidney beans. They say that there are bacterial overgrowth happens in the small bowel of the rat when they give them PHA. And what they say in this paper, there was no specific association between lectins and the bacteria, but what appeared to happen was that the mucosal surface changed when the phytohemagglutinins were administered, leading to contact between intestinal bacteria and the epithelium, which led to inflammation. So I think that the compelling hypothesis here is that these phytohemagglutinins from red kidney beans, these lectins in plants, perhaps more broadly, may damage or cause issues in the mucosal producing cells, the goblet cells of the gut, and they may decrease the mucosal layer of the gut. They do appear to lead to um, this induced overgrowth of the small intestine and inflammation. And so I don't think there's something we should be putting in our guts. There's also good evidence that other lectins like potato lectin, I know many of you love your potatoes, but I see things like this and I just can't get behind white potatoes. Potato lectin activates basophils and mast cells, two components of the immune system in atopic subjects, which are subjects with A to P. Generally conditions like asthma and eczema are considered to be atopic. I happen to be one of these individuals. And they do this by interacting with the core chitobios of cell-bound nonspecific immunoglobulin E. The takeaway here is that potato lectin triggers your immune system. 
uh, or at least triggers the immune systems of atopic subjects. One of the things that I think is important to consider about my perspectives that may be lost in a lot of what I do is the notion that if you are thriving, if you are truly kicking ass, why change anything about your diet? Most of what I do is for those of you who are still suffering, despite what you believe are all of the stops being pulled out in your healthy diet, but you may still be eating things like tomato, red kidney beans, potatoes, things with lectins. You may still be eating sourdough bread, which has gluten, even though it's fermented and you're suffering. These are the pieces of information for you guys, for the people that are continuing to suffer with those conditions. If you're thriving, why change anything? This may not apply to you. Though I think that most of us could be better in many of these conditions. Dietary emulsifier induced low grade inflammation promotes colon carcinogenesis. Yet another thing that I believe can cause issues in the human gut. What are dietary emulsifiers? The biggest one is carrageenan. They studied um, carboxymethylcellulose, polysorbate 80, but there have been other studies with carrageenan that show similar inflammation in the gut of both humans and animal models. What is carrageenan in? Well, carrageenan is a long sulfated polysaccharide found in algae. Yet another reason I'm not a fan of eating lots of algae is things like sea moss are full of carrageenan, but you also find carrageenan in many nut milks, many fake milks, many products that are meant to be thickened. A lot of yogurts have carrageenan. Read the labels, guys. In fact, better, why are you eating foods with labels? Seriously, why are you eating foods with labels? The next couple of studies will probably be not surprising to many of you. The title of this article is a high glucose or a high glucose or fructose diet cause changes of the gut microbiota and metabolic disorders in mice without body weight change. It's an animal study, but it's enough to raise eyebrows and get me thinking, okay, we need more studies like this in humans, but why would you put high glucose or high fructose diets into your gut, especially those that are processed sugars? Again, I stand with Robert Lustig here partially, and then I think you can eat as much fruit as you want without damaging your body. As I hinted out at the beginning of the podcast, I'm not very metabolically damaged eating 200 grams of carbohydrates from honey and sugar every day with an insulin of 2.4 that is fasting, but processed sugar would be a different story. I don't know that if I, I don't know, I really, I don't think I really want to volunteer for this experiment, but it would be interesting to see if someone could eat 200 grams of processed sugar a day and maintain the same, I suppose, metabolomics from their microbiome and insulin sensitivity that I'm demonstrating with 200 grams of carbohydrates from organic fruit and glyphosate free honey. But nevertheless, consider that study and consider this one, which I think is very striking with regard to seed oils. The title of this study is fish oil, which is an omega-3 predominant oil attenuates omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid induced dysbiosis and infectious colitis. But the fish oil impairs lipopolysaccharide dephosphorylation activity causing sepsis. The point of showing this study is to illustrate that in animal models, you can induce dysbiosis and infectious colitis by giving animals omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids. And you can partially rescue that with fish oil but then fish oil caused other problems like sepsis. So I'm not a fan of excess fish oil, but I'm definitely not a fan of excess omega-6, polyunsaturated fatty acids, things like linoleic acid, which is the mortal enemy, causes dysbiosis. So just one study, I can't go into tons of studies in this podcast without it being three hours long. Um, a couple of studies to illustrate that seed oils and processed sugars are damaging your gut, which makes it unsurprising that a very low carbohydrate diet improves, G, uh, improves gastroesophageal reflux and its symptoms. That's actually the title of a paper that I have on the screen from July, 2006. I think that the, um, the reason this may be the case is because when you are on a very low carbohydrate diet, you are cutting out so many of these processed sugars, beans, grains like wheat, you can't have any of those in your diet if you are very low carbohydrate. I don't think a very low carbohydrate diet is a good uh, strategy for humans long-term. I talked about that earlier in the podcast, and perhaps in the future, we will do more studies with Stefan Van Vliet looking at an animal-based diet for GERD and its symptoms. Nevertheless, it is important to note that 
dietary modifications can be very powerful for GERD. And that dietary modification removes many of the things that I've talked about containing lectins, gliadin, wheat, things like that. So that is something to notice as well. The last thing I want to share in this portion of the podcast is a paper uh, looking at a title, Leaky Gut, Leaky Brain. Leaky brain is a comorbid condition with leaky gut in many individuals, suggesting that perhaps the blood pain barrier opens in the same way that the gastrointestinal epithelial cells do. So you could have a fenestrated epithelium in the gut, and you might also have a fenestrated epithelium for the blood-brain barrier. Many of these conditions co-occur. We do know that there are many neuropsychological, neuropsychiatric manifestations of gluten syndromes. The paper I showed earlier with non-celiac gluten sensitivity talked about neuroinflammation. And I think that many of the things that open your gut epithelium will cause the potential or lead to a potential for leaky brain. Don't do it, guys. Don't do it. 